Welcome to Clued in Mystery. I'm Sarah. And I'm Brooke. And we both love mystery. Hi, Brooke. Hi, Sarah. It's our favorite time of the week again. I know. This is honestly is my favorite day and my favorite hour of the week is is the hour that you and I spend together talking about mystery. (laughs) I know. It's so much fun. And today we have a super fun topic. Do you want to introduce everyone to our topic today, Sarah? Absolutely. So last year, towards the end of our first set of episodes, we spoke about spy fiction. And most of the episode, we talked about Ian Fleming and John le Carré and the characters that they created. They are, of course, masters of the spy fiction genre. But today, we wanted to talk about some other spies. And I have to say, Brooke, I had so much fun with this. So I have a a long list of other spies and other spy fiction authors. And it was hard to choose who to talk about. Uh, But I will start with uh, Christopher or Kit Marlowe. So he, we mentioned him actually in the introduction of our first spy episode, because uh, he was an Elizabethan playwright and was known to be part of a spy network maintained by Francis Walsingham. There's actually a series of novels about him written by M.J. Tro that fits into several categories. He's an example of an author as a sleuth, a celebrity sleuth, uh, as well as historical fiction and spy fiction. And I think he's fascinating for several reasons, in part because there's a lot of mystery around his death uh, and whether it was the result of real spy work that he was doing. We also talked a little bit about spy fiction with a focus on women. Uh, And I mentioned Kate Quinn, uh, who authored The Rose Code and The Alice Network. Uh, And, you know, I did a a quick search on Google and typed in women, you know, women spy fiction. And there are so many examples, largely historical mysteries. It's a pretty strong signal that these are going to be Uh, women spy fiction novels because of the cover. So it's often a woman from behind, uh, maybe looking off to the side or looking, you know, we can't see her face. Um, It's a pretty strong signal that, uh, that this will be something about uh, a woman and, and spy typically in the, in the second world war. Uh, But I did recently read and really enjoyed uh, Foul Lady Fortune by Chloe Gong, which is a historical mystery, features a woman who is very much uh, engaging in spy espionage activities. There's also a supernatural element to these books. Uh, And this is the first of, I believe she's planned two books in this series. She's written another series that uh, there's some characters, I think this is a spinoff from uh, her earlier series, and I haven't read any of those other books, but in the author's note, she does say, I encourage you to read the other books first before you read this one if you don't want any spoilers, um, but I will be reading them in the wrong order because I will definitely be be reading those others, mm-hmm. but it was it was excellent, Brooke. You know, when we were talking about this episode, I said to you, you know, I just don't really read very much spy fiction. That's kind of your thing. You, you know, you've really dabbled in a lot of it. But then when you started naming off authors, I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Because I think, and this is, I think, a common um, situation that you automatically gravitate towards in your mind, if you think about spies, the, you know, the Jack Ryans and the Le Carre characters and um, Ian Fleming stories. And I really had to dial it back and go, no, I really do. I love all the Bletchley Circle tales about uh, you know the the everyday people that became spies. I I love the um, the kind of literary uh, spy fiction that we see. You know, there's the the librarian spy and the book spy, uh, and I I got to thinking like sometimes we miscategorize those and we just think of them as um, maybe maybe thrillers. I don't know, but they really are spy fiction. And then I I was thinking about it a little further. And I wonder if we could kind of consider those versus the more action adventure spy books as cozy spy novels. Yeah, I think that's a really, um, a really good question. And, And I was kind of thinking about them 
about this sort of subgenre being on a spectrum. So, uh, and I will refer to Le Carre and, and Ian Fleming as kind of either end of that spectrum, right? So Le Carre, I think, is more of, like you say, that cozy spy um, mysteries. And then Ian Fleming is the more action spy in in the subgenre. Um, and like with mystery, generally, there's a lot of variation between those two points. Like Jack Ryan, I would position closer to uh, Bond, right? Or Born um, in terms of being much more uh, action oriented. Um, yeah, it's a really great observation. I also liked that in your entry, you talked about the way that there are various subgenres within the subgenre. Um, you know, you get the action adventure, like we just said, there's usually political elements. Many of these are historical. So if you're into historicals, you can grab one of those and even sci-fi. Absolutely. Uh, and I've been thinking a little bit about what makes the genre so appealing. I wonder if it has something to do with how a lot of the stories, and particularly, I think, you know, if we're thinking about those cozier spy mysteries, um, but even to some extent, I think maybe some of the action ones, um, how a lot of the narrative mirrors reality. And so what I mean is that there are people whose job it is to gather intelligence. And obviously, there are police detectives, and it's their job to solve to solve crimes. Um, but and with with books in both detective and in spy fiction, I think some of them can feel a lot more plausible than some of those others that I still love, but others that that fit under the mystery umbrella. A lot of the women's spy fiction is either based on actual characters or people who've been inspired by actual women who worked during the Second World War and worked at Bletchley or you know, were used in uh, the resistance or, or uh, you know, because they were not uh, perceived to be threats. I think you're you're right. It makes it so accessible. Um, I can't really put myself in the shoes of James Bond or that lifestyle, uh, but I can definitely imagine what it would be like to just be this normal gal who happened to be good at crosswords and have a knock. By the way, I'm not good at crosswords, but I can, I can use my imagination, <laughs> but have that knock, <laughs> that knock at the door and be like, Hey, we need your level of expertise. You have this special skill. It's so appealing to hear that person's story. Um, and I think that, you know, in our earlier episode, we discussed that spies asked ask big questions. Uh, you know, they say, you know, what am I here for? Who am I? Um, there are some deep, you know, human condition questions that happen in spy fiction. And I think that we get that a lot in these, um, women as spies because they are taken out of a very, um, normal everyday lifestyle. And they're put into this exciting world even though maybe they're sitting at a desk, they're literally changing the course of history. And then they go back to their everyday life, washing dishes, raising children, and are to never speak of that time in their life again. And so um, I think it opens up a lot of questions about, um, you know, is that fair? Um, women's rights, women's roles, and not just women. Certainly there were men that worked at Bletchley as well. But a lot of these stories, I think, ask those questions about um, women in the war and the role that they played when they don't get to wear the medals on their chest. Yeah, that's 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 really interesting, Brooke. And I think part of that is because of the secrets around the work that they were doing, right? And now enough time has elapsed that those secrets are, are coming out. It is a really interesting point because those secrets have been kept for so long. Uh, but we think about, you know, more modern day spy fiction or, or some of those stories that are set more modern day. And it doesn't seem to be a secret, whatever it is that that they're about, right? Like I'm, I'm thinking about um, Jack Carr's series uh, that I think uh, is now an Amazon series, um, where 
uh, and the first book is called Terminalist. Um, and so I, st- I started listening to it. I haven't finished it, but in the first part of the book, it's actually a, an author's note from him talking about, um, he talks about the writing process and kind of how he got the books and eventually how he got the show produced. But what I found was really fascinating was he talks about the vetting process when he writes his books, because he was actually, I believe he was a Navy SEAL, that lends some authenticity to uh, to the stories. And we've talked about that in the past, about you know that um, having someone writing about, about what they know. But uh, in this author's note, he talks about how everything that he writes has to be vetted by this uh, special government office in the U.S. that ensures that he has not shared anything that would compromise actual people who are in the field, uh, which, is, which is fascinating. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. And so that phenomenon continues where you need these, these people who worked in this, um, you know, MI6, MI5, whatever they were to remain silent about their work, which makes perfect sense. And so in a sense, it's, it's continuing. He has to be, um, monitored to make sure he doesn't reveal something that's fascinating, Sarah. I really enjoyed that part. So if even if you are not going to listen to or read the rest of the book, I recommend that first author's note section um, just to, to learn a little bit more about that. Uh, you know, I mentioned uh, Foul Lady Fortune and there's the supernatural element in that. I read another book that had a supernatural element uh, and it had a, a woman as spy uh, theme as well, but it was set in modern day and um, it was YA spy fiction. So I'm talking about Truly Deadly by Rob Aspinall. And uh, this is, uh, like I said, uh, um, a young woman is the main character and the premise is that she has had a heart transplant and the heart the donor heart comes from a man who was um, was a spy or or certainly someone who was working in a um, spy like capacity and it's it's not entirely clear who he is part of part of the the book that i read was trying to figure out you know not only like how does having this heart impact her uh, and she all of a sudden has these spy fighting abilities and um you know she can drive cars in in uh high <laughs> high speed chases <laughs> skills that she didn't have as as uh as a regular teenage girl and part of the book is trying to figure out okay well like who is this guy and i, I think it's the first of a series and i'll i'll definitely check out some of the others because i i liked this character and 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 the premise right it's obviously not not based in reality but um it was it was kind of fun I love that. We see that um, need in even detection fiction to uh, have a reason why this person is suddenly able to, as an amateur sleuth, say, uh, solve a crime. When you have paranormal reasons come in, it's sometimes really fun. I've never seen that it's a donor organ that suddenly gives them all these skills, but it's genius. I love that idea. And it almost seems plausible. Like you never know when you get someone else's uh, DNA, what it could do for you. I love that. Yeah, no, no, I thought it was, I thought it was really clever. So just continuing on the YA theme, Anthony Horowitz has written a series uh, about a young spy named Alex Ryder. And uh, so much like the women that we were talking about before, you know, being used as spies because they were um, underestimated, uh, the premise is very similar with this series, right? He's, um, uh, I think, 14 when the series starts and he's able to go into situations that uh, adults wouldn't necessarily be able to to go into. Um, and this is a, a, a this series is a little bond like because he does get some gadgets as he goes off on on uh, his his various adventures. Um, but it's quite fun. And there is a television version that uh, is on Amazon Prime um, all, by the same name, Alex Ryder. And uh, it's it's lots of fun uh, to watch. Yeah, that sounds great. Anything that Horowitz does, 
I'm pretty much guaranteed that it's going to be great. And um, I do, I have not read or watched it yet, but I imagine that it's sort of like a young Bond. That's how the picture that I have in my mind is maybe like, you know, who he was when he was a teen. Um, But I love that. And I also love the idea of bringing in um, the next generation. I think that's something that YA fiction does so well and and is so important that um, whether we're talking about uh, spy thrillers or, um, you know, just an actual whodunit, I love the idea that we're bringing in the next generation and keeping it current for them so that they can find something in the genre to um, to hold on to and to, to carry it into the future. Exactly. And, you know, I know there's a lot of adult readers, including me, of YA fiction. So, you know, it it satisfies uh, a lot of people, I think, to have to have those. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's another layer of what we were saying, because any of those amateur doing something fantastic are such an accessible thing for a reader because we would love to have seen ourselves as a kid get maybe chosen for this mission or trained for this mission. So I think that's something that makes YA fiction so much fun. It's fun to harken back and to feel like, what would have that been like to be a young person um, and live out some of those fantasies? So you know something is a big deal and hugely popular when it gets parodied. So I think that we need to... Not forget to mention um, the spies such as Austin Powers, which is 100% a James Bond parody, I think. All that 1960s flair. Yeah, those movies are great. And when you can poke fun at a genre, like we've discussed before in different ways, um, it's it's just great fun. Um, And then another spy parody is Perry the Platypus, who is on Phineas and Ferb. This is a a Disney cartoon series that was popular when my teenage daughter was younger. We were huge Phineas and Ferb fans in this household. It's actually a great show with a through storyline that's that's very heartwarming. But their pet platypus named Perry is actually a secret operative. And it's just like a hilarious little part of the um of the family life cartoon so i encourage you to check it out in uh as another spy parody i have never heard of that brooke and i'm gonna have to see if we can if we can find it because um you know i have a a a young person in my household and i love exposing him to mystery and uh i think he would he would probably enjoy that yeah, you're going to get a big kick out of it when you see the way that the each episode is constructed and what Perry's doing behind the scenes. It's it's adorable. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for that. And thank you for all these great suggestions. You're definitely uh, the member of our team that is more versed in spy thrillers and spy fiction. So um, thank you so much for for getting us going on this conversation today. Well, thank you, Brooke. And I have to admit that until I did our, until we did our first spy episode last year, I hadn't read that much spy fiction, but I've been uh, finding myself uh, choosing books in the, in the subgenre more and more frequently. It's, it's really something that I've, I've come to love over the last year. That's great. I think that that's something that the podcast has done for both of us is that we're um, finding new little niches that we that we love and and new bits of information to research. And it's just it's just fantastic for me, too. And we hope that you all enjoyed our episode today as well. And thank you for joining us on Clued in Mystery. I'm Brooke. And I'm Sarah. And we both love mystery. Clued in Mystery is produced by Brooke Peterson and Sarah M. Stephen. Music is by Shane Ivers at silvermansound.com. Visit us online at cluedinmystery.com or social media at cluedinmystery. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing, leaving a review, or telling your friends.